Now, the Ottomans will eventually go into decline for multiple reasons. The Janissaries, remember, they were initially this powerful force loyal to the Sultan because they had no one else to be loyal to. But eventually, they're going to be allowed to marry and have their own families. So while they can't be loyal to their old family, they can be loyal to their new family. And also, after a while, they realize, you know, there's a lot of us, but there's only one Sultan. So if we just work together, if we just stick together as a class, we can do what we want. We can control the Sultan, and eventually that's what happens. The Sultans eventually become dominated by their own Janissaries. In addition, um, we're dealing with an empire that, as um, impressive as it is, is still limited by space. Um, remember, they don't have cell phones or um, automobiles or airplanes or anything that allows you to travel very quickly or to communicate quickly. That means that your empire can only get so big before it becomes difficult to control it. The further you are away from the Ottoman Sultan, let's say you're in western part of North Africa, you can kind of do what you want, and the Ottoman Sultan can't do anything about it. So, for example, um, if you're far off in western North Africa, far away from the Sultan, and he wants you to send him taxes you're probably not going to send him much or any because you know he can't do much about it. So over time, you have these weak emperors who are unable, sultans who are unable to control the, the empire. It's so big. They have trouble collecting money. If you have trouble collecting money, your army's not going to be as good. They're going to start losing wars. And in particular, the Europeans are going to become more and more powerful and better enemies. Um, we don't talk a whole lot about this, but when I talked about how in 1683... The um, Ottomans almost uh, took the city of Vienna in Austria. What saved the Austrians, uh, the, known as the Holy Roman Empire at that time, was this guy, John Sobieski, a Polish um, king, who actually took an army down from Poland to fight and help defeat the Ottomans and drive them back. So they're going to start, um, the Ottomans are going to start losing war, wars, and they will eventually fall behind in technology and science. Now here's the thing. Science and technology could have fixed all, a lot of this, right? If the Ottomans had been able to develop advanced technology and science, they could have had an increase in productivity that would have helped them to make their treasury larger. They could have uh, fielded be stronger and better armies and things like that. But even though they had all this wealth and power, they are going to fall behind. Right? So why does that happen? What prevented the rise of science in the Ottoman Empire? Now, this is a very complex question, but one thing we have to note, and that's why I had this image here, is that uh, it, for many uh, hundreds of years, one of the centers of science, uh, more advanced than European science, in fact, was in the Islamic world. Right? And if you took History 121, we spent a lot of time talking about this, but one thing I want to emphasize, um, especially in like the 9th and 10th centuries, uh, the Islamic world is the center of science in many ways. So this further complicates this problem. You know, why was it that they didn't develop a scientific revolution? And I think we can see that example in the person of Takiuddin. Uh, Takiuddin was interested in astronomy. Um, like I said, astronomy doesn't seem very important at first. It's like, well, how does, you know, being able to understand the stars, how does that make you um, a better, uh, give you more power? Uh, remember, though, it is important because to do astronomy, you need math. Once you get math, uh, physics, engineering, uh, all those wonderful things, then you can start building really complex machines and stuff like that. And Takiuddin um, is this man interested in astronomy. He's a Muslim. He's an Ottoman, a member of the Ottoman Empire. And he's going to build an observatory. And I believe this image actually here is um, an example of his observatory, of all these you know, Muslims working together to better understand the world through science. So I want to stress, there are Muslims who believe that science is a good thing, and who were following it, and trying to use it to better understand the world. But some Muslims opposed. They saw science as a threat. Uh, basically, they argued that if you understood how the natural world worked through your mind, um, that meant that there were rational rules that governed the universe, and that meant God was bound by rules, and God can't be bound by rules because he's all-powerful. Moreover, as scientists rose in power, right, if, if science is where knowledge is, true knowledge is gained from, they're going to get more money, they're going to get more support. That means less money and support for the religious authorities. So some Muslims, especially among the religious leadership, 
opposed the growth of science. They saw it as a threat, right? They saw it as dangerous. Now, and they also saw it as, like I said, as a threat to faith, but also a threat to their own position in society. Now, what's complicated in this time period, um, this isn't modern science. So for people living this time period, um, you know, we think of astrology as kind of superstition. I mean, even people who read their horoscopes don't usually really believe in it. They just kind of do it for fun. Um, in this time period, though, astrology was serious and it was connected to astronomy. In fact, astrology was seen as more important because it was considered practical, right? Because you could use it to predict the future. So if you were an astronomer, usually you were also an astrologer. And Takyudin was both. That's how things worked during this time period. And there was a big battle coming up between the Ottoman Empire, I think it was the Safavids, who we're going to talk about later, and Takyudin was asked, well, use your astrology skills to tell us who's going to win the battle. And of course he said, oh, um, we're going to totally win the battle. The Sultan's totally going to win because what other prediction would you make, right? And they lost, right? They lost the battle. So Takyudin, you know, he, he picked the wrong side. He said, we're going to win the battle, um, you know, according to my astrological predictions, but instead they lost the battle. And so what this led to was the anti-science Muslim said, see, this astronomy is no good. The observatory is a waste of time. By building this kind of uh, supporting science in this way, you're just going to lead people astray from true Islam. And um, why waste money on something like that? That's only going to hurt us. As you can see, it's useless because he predicted the battle wrong. So this will lead to the destruction of the observatory. And in a sense, a victory for anti-science Muslims against pro-science Muslims. So this is very important for us to understand. It's not that Islam itself is against science. There were Muslims like Takiuddin who thought science was great and devoted their lives to it. There were also Muslims who said science is bad, it will hurt your faith. And uh, of course also, you know, they realized that if science becomes really big, they'll get the money and support, religion won't. So this is a problem. Um, from the Islamic world's perspective because the anti-science Muslims win. It could have gone the other way in some respects. And to show you how this kind of continues in the Ottoman world, um, printing will not be allowed. So one thing we talk about in the rise of Western science is how important it is the printing press because it allows for books to be produced and shared cheaply, which means scientists are able to share ideas with each other. Ottoman scientists can't do that. And they're also going to have difficulty getting access to Western books. So you can think about this. Think about a scientist who has access to the internet in competition with a scientist who does not have access to the internet, right? The scientist with access to the internet is going to make a lot more um, discoveries. It's just going to be a better scientist. And that's essentially what was happening in the Ottoman Empire, right? The Muslim scientists there, after the fall of Takyuddin, they're going to be doing their best to keep up and to make developments, but they're not getting the support Western scientists are, and they're cut off from knowledge, right? They don't have access to the internet, obviously, but in this time period, printed books would have been the internet. In contrast, European scientists, through cheap printed books, are able to share their ideas, build off of each other, and that help leads to a scientific revolution. So the key thing here, though, is science is not going to rise in the Ottoman Empire. This could have helped them fix their situation. But for these reasons, the victory, in a sense, of Pro, of anti-science Muslims against pro-science Muslims is going to prevent that. So the, the one key takeaway here, of course, is that Islam is not inherently anti-science, but some forms of Islam are hostile to science, and they're the ones that are going to win out in the Ottoman Empire and help prevent the rise of an Islamic scientific revolution, leaving the way open for Europeans to develop the scientific revolution.